What's going on, my man? Hey, how you doing? Is it too messy behind me? No, nah, mate, don't worry. It's all good. All right, good. I'm in my uh, You're garage in your... slash man cave. Your man cave. Yeah, I've read about your man cave. <laughs> <laughs> I got all my Seahawk stuff. You're a bit of a Seahawk fan, mate. Yeah, big time. Yeah, that's where you came from up north, did you? Yeah, Seattle. Yeah, from Seattle. Yeah. Was the most unchurched city in, in the country for a while, wasn't it? Yeah, that's right here. I, I mean, I was unchurched. I didn't grow up Christian, so. Yeah. So you got, I read you're you a bit of a golfer, right? That was, your, that was your, originally your your scholarship, was it? It's college. Yep, that was. I'm, I'm a golfer. Yeah. So what you what you obviously decided when you got saved, you changed your mind about becoming a pro golfer, did you? Yep, I did. I uh, Yeah, it was pretty powerful. I was at a, a retreat, like at a campsite, and we were studying the Gospel of Mark, and... It was going through the middle part of Mark where the disciples are getting tons of faith checks. Yep. And it was there that I was praying. I was like, God, I want to live by faith. Just tell me what I need to do. And I, I heard God so clearly tell me I need to quit golf. Is that right? I needed to uh, follow him deeper into different plans for him. And that was a faith check. Oh, for sure. For sure. Especially when <laughs> yeah. you've lived your life for that. Totally. So it was just a huge part of my identity being... Um, rooted in him and that's kind of when my evangelism gift really came out even more fully and just started having some more spiritual gifts come forward so it was just a really important time in my life but the main premise that i really got out of your book was the whole concept that you know god is in the awkward and i think that's a big deal for for a lot of people here in australia in the secular society we're in people don't want to be awkward they that sort of changed my whole view about how to see God in the, those the awkwardness of those conversations. Tell me about how you first discovered that print that principle yourself. Yeah, that's a great question. I think I uh, probably the way that I first discovered it was you know I since becoming a Christian when I was early in college, I always had no problem sharing my faith and um, I did it regularly. And I've seen a lot of people come to faith, and I used to get really frustrated when people wouldn't share their faith, and especially when I was more immature in my yeah, faith. Yeah, sure. Was, Why can't you, you know, just speak up and talk about your faith? Yeah. Yeah, I'd pester people about it. Like, what are you so worried about? And I think it was probably about 10 years ago I started realizing, you know, obviously I knew that people felt uncomfortable and they felt nervous or they were worried about, you know, pushing people away or um, being too strong or something like that. But then as I started analyzing my own journey, I realized, you know, I feel awkward a lot of times too, but I'm willing to withstand it. I have a higher threshold, sure. guess, of feeling awkward. Yep. And so as I started paying attention to that, something I started saying more regularly to people was, you know, um, just because you're a gifted evangelist or you're more bold than someone doesn't mean that you don't feel awkward too. Sure. And I started helping people understand that I felt awkward as well and I would share stories, but I was willing to kind of stay in it um, and, and see what God might do. Um, that was the first part. The second part was as I was studying um, Acts 8 and I was just meditating on it and, and looking more at Philip and looking more at that encounter, I just started realizing how weird that was that he sent him down that desert road yeah. and to the chariot and as I just started even visualizing what it must have looked like, I just realized that must have been so awkward. Yeah. And, um, you know, like you do when you're in scripture, you just start asking questions about God. And one of the most basic questions is like, well, what does this say about God? Yeah. Then I realized, well, God's not, you know, worried about sending people into awkward situations. Sure. Great. So I think that scripture and then my own experience had just started um, realizing that God is in the awkward. Sure. And, and then obviously that leads to questions like, well, is he always in awkward or is, you know, are there certain situations that maybe we're just making it weird and it has yeah. nothing to do with God. So yeah. that's how it all started. And that's when I started kind of putting together some of my thinking and training and writing around that. Oh, that's fantastic. I think, I think the reason it's had so much uh, impact in my life and the people that I'm ministering to is that I'm, I often say to the church, whenever we're talking about outreach or evangelism, I'll just sort of pop survey the church in the middle of a sermon and I'll just say, and I did it when I launched this sermon a few weeks ago, I said, well, who who in the room finds it easy to talk about their faith? And almost without exception, I usually find about 10% of the people put their hand up. I don't know if that's the stats you, you tend to find, but 10% right. naturally do it. The other 90%, I'm thinking to myself, for a whole host of reasons, 
those 90%, and I'm one of them, don't necessarily find it easy to do that. And yet I know for a fact that, you know, we were all charged with the responsibility of spreading the gospel. We're not supposed to leave it to those 10%. And, and I think uh, that's why I was so moved by what you've said, because you've, your whole concept is very empowering, uh, because it really does empower the 90% who don't do it naturally that they can do something about sharing their faith in a way that isn't coming across as the really obnoxious street corner preacher that puts everybody off and actually, you know, really, in, certainly over here in Australia, that kind of mentality doesn't have much success. It tends to alienate people from the gospel rather than brings them to it. And so I was so right. encouraged by your concept and the whole thought of the way you said that. That's great. Yeah, and you found that yourself. That you know, It's good to hear you say that, uh, you know, it's still awkward for you, but you pushed through it. Yeah, I mean, what I would say is um, the people that I know that are the most effective in sharing their faith whether they're gifted evangelists or they're just a faithful witness. I mean, there's a lot of people. We're all called to witness. Yeah, absolutely. Not, we're not all evangelists. Not sure. And um, even the most faithful people I know that share their faith or are open with their faith, if you ask anyone that's seen breakthrough with leading someone to Christ or helping them get closer, I guarantee you they will say there was a tense moment or there sure. was an awkward moment. Yeah. And so it's just I started putting all this together and realizing that there's hardly ever a breakthrough moment that didn't have an awkward moment precede it. Fantastic. And most of us come back and we say, I'm not an evangelist or God doesn't use me or why don't I see God do anything? And then I, I've started just asking him, well, um, when it got awkward, what did you do? And, and most, most of the time say, well, I shut it down or I turned around and I yeah. say, well, I That's bet why. if you would have stayed in the moment and stayed in the heat, stayed yeah. in the kitchen a little yeah. bit longer. <laughs> yeah. It might have been, you know, something popped out. Yeah, that's that's powerful because I think that's what that that's been the revolution in my own life and in people around me talking to them. People really do think that the moment it's awkward, we're out. God can't be in it. It'll, you know, like you said, it, it, it God's in the awkward rather than, I guess, uh, the thought being that um, if if it's going to be God, then it's, they're going to walk up to you and get saved. They're going to say, "How can I get saved?" And they're just going to walk into your world and say, "I've seen the way you live your life. Tell me how to get saved." And uh, yeah. that just doesn't happen. Right. Or or God is uh, a God of comfort or yeah. um, ease. Yeah, sure. Or, you know, it's just it's always going to be on our terms or what we think is normal. Absolutely. And so we, we all have that theology rooted in us that's yeah. just not correct. And, it's, and that's correct. It's Western theology. It's, it's Western comfort theology, fast food mentality. Everything will be handed to us on a silver platter. And it's not the way God is. Yeah, and so I just even started reading through the Gospels again, too, and just paying attention to what were the awkward moments. Great. And gosh, man, there's so many that Jesus goes into where you're like, I mean, woman at the well, or yeah. the demoniac in Mark 5, or, you know, so many where you're like, that is just very, like, unnerving or politically incorrect. Oh, for or, sure. Jesus doesn't worry about that political correctness, does he? So it's it, it has to... It has to um, disorient us a little bit and, and make us think great yeah, we might come back to that political correctness sure. thing in a moment this this sunday i'm preaching i'm going to pick up and use your, your stuff you just mentioned about philip the evangelist and i think what was powerful for me in that was the, the way you said god gave philip the initial call to to leave leave samaria and go into the desert but then from that point on god's silent in the matter he, he just he says, you know, go and stand by the chariot. But basically, he's not giving clear direction. Philip's having to right. figure it out on his own. And I think, um, commentate on that a bit, because I think when you, you know, if, you, if someone's witnessing to their person at university or in their workplace or their neighbor, that whole concept of waiting on the Holy Spirit, listening to him, being present in a person's life um, in order to look to find those moments. Can you sort of elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, I, I love that observation, and whenever I train on that, um, it makes people uncomfortable. I just did a training on it last week, and someone was said, you know, I think he, they raised their hand in the seminar, and they said, you know, you need to give the Holy Spirit more credit. The Holy Spirit's totally working in that encounter the whole way through, and and I said, I, I know he is, but it's interesting that he's um, – observably silent yeah, in the passage. Absolutely. And it has to say something. And, and people are so uncomfortable about that because it can feel like we're just giving, putting all the pressure on us. But the way I'd comment on that is the Holy Spirit is a great initiator of um, encounters. He's obviously ascending God. 
um, sending all the way through the Bible since the beginning, and we see that in Acts 8. But what I find interesting is if we are filled with the Spirit and we are um, sent as witnesses, as Acts 1 yep. you know, yep. tells us, then I think what Philip is showing us is that we need to be ready to share. Yeah. Um, there's, there's a difference between the person who is sent by God looking for opportunities and a person who's sent by God hoping there is no opportunity. Yes. And, you know, we play baseball here. I, I'm sorry, um, I've never watched cricket. So don't, don't worry know. about it. I played baseball. I'm a mad baseball uh, fan. I'm one of the few Australians that actually likes baseball, so that's fine, though. Okay. <laughs> well, so a funny thing in baseball, when, when you're playing baseball and you're little, is you always know the difference between, you know, someone who's going to be a good player and a bad player. The, the, the good players are like, I hope they hit it to me. I hope they hit yeah, it to me. Absolutely. And, yeah. The that bad was players shortstop, like, I loved it. <laughs> right. The, the bad players are like, don't, I hope the ball never comes my way. Great point. And I think a lot of us in our Christian faith were like that. Yeah. We're like, I want to be sent by God, but I hope, I hope he never sends anything my way. Great, and great so point. I think Philip is, the reason that the spirit goes silent there in a sense is, he doesn't need this, he doesn't need the spirit to speak to him there. He's like, I'm ready for this moment. He's, like, he's already on mission. He's on mission. He yeah. hears the guy he, he, uh, reading scripture. He he knows he needs to instigate the conversation or at least be proactive. And he just knows that's his job. Like sure. that's what it means to be an ambassador for Christ. That's yeah. what it means to be a witness. And um, I love that uh, partnership of like the spirit sent him out of the ordinary that yep. he was thinking of. But as he's being sent, he's like wide open looking. And as soon as he sees it, he's like, "Oh, I know why I'm here. You, you don't even have to tell me." No, he was on. He was on mission to start with. I think it's incredible. I think you mentioned it too. That you know, probably the three most supernatural evangelistic encounters in the Book of Acts are uh, uh, Cornelius, Saul, and uh, and that story with Philip and the Ethiopian. And yet, in every one of those, God still requires a person to tell a person about Jesus. Yep. And you know, so people can't have this expectation that Jesus is going to do all the work. He, he's saying, no, no, I, I've called you to go and do it. So, you know, God's showing up in supernatural ways, and He still says to Saul, "Hey, I'm not going to preach the gospel to you." Jesus says, "I want you to go and get Aeneas to preach the gospel to you." Yep. He's, he always works that way, doesn't he? There, there's you cannot find a story in the New Testament no. where a person doesn't uh, share with another person. For sure. God never leads someone to Jesus without a person. It's amazing, isn't it? Because I, I think yeah. our culture. I, we know that intellectually, but I think our culture in the in the Christian church, certainly here in Australia, is largely not that way. I think people do kind of have this view um, uh, that you know, well, we pray and God will bring in the harvest, rather than right. Jesus saying He's asking the Lord of the harvest to go out into the harvest field and and do the reaping. And I know we pay mental assent to that, but I, I'm really wanting to, I guess, shift that and have our church shift that. Um, through all levels of our church so that we really mobilize our people to realize that, hey, our call is to get out there into the world, not just yeah. uh, not just hang a sign on the door at a church and expect people to come to us. That's great. And uh, one of my buddies says um, a really good quote. He says, there's no self-interpreting sign. Great. And so you, someone may encounter a miracle like Saul or you may do a good deed that provokes someone's curiosity, but we always need to interpret with words what God's doing. Fantastic. I like and it. That's the point of a witness is to interpret signs. So even if a miraculous happens, we've got to be ready to share, interpret, and, and explain the gospel to them. Brilliant. Brilliant. That's great. Hey, I wanted to pick up on that thing about being politically correct because it's the whole awkward thing. You said Jesus you know, Jesus was very awkward with some of the things he said. He didn't, he didn't mind uh, um, broaching, I guess, political correctness for the sake of preaching it. And so maybe you, you did it really well when you talked about how the, the Great Commission actually flies in the face of uh, of the social norms of today, what's politically correct, mind your own business, stay stay in your place, don't express truth, truth's relative, and so on. Do you want to unpack that a bit for um, for our leaders to hear what your thoughts are on that? Yeah, and um, I'm actually uh, speaking on that at, church, at a church this weekend. And um, just... I don't think most of us have thought about why we're uncomfortable with sharing our faith, especially in a, a secular culture. And so I, I wrote that part just to help us kind of become more self-aware that if we're going to decide to share our faith, so when you speak at church on Sunday and you're going to charge people to share their faith and be bold, 
it's almost like we need to we need to help people understand and make a commitment at church before they leave. Sure. They're like I'm willing to be politically incorrect. Okay, got ya. <laughs> like we have to make a we have to make a statement and almost like confess our idol with being politically correct. Now I don't mean being rude. I don't think those are, are the same thing necessarily or mutually exclusive. You can be unpolitically correct and still polite or kind. Yeah, without being obnoxious about what you believe. Right, you don't have to be obnoxious. But when I mean politically correct, I think I had three points. I, I know I can remember two off the top of my head. One is, you know, don't press people about what's real what's or really true. What's really true, yep. We, don't, we shouldn't ever do that, especially in a relativistic society. It's politically incorrect when relativism reigns. Yeah, for sure. Tell someone there's a certain way or a certain truth. There's a certain, a certain benchmark way. of truth they have to live by, yeah. So you have to be willing when someone says something you don't agree with or believe in, instead of saying, well, that that's okay for you, we have to be willing to say, well, do you mind if I share with you a different way? Right. You know, that presses a little bit, and that makes us like, oh. So that's the um, awkward bit, I guess. That's awkward. And that's, uh, and that's at that point, you, you're letting them know that you have a different value and a different system. And uh, there's nothing wrong. You're not, you haven't been rude at that point. You haven't been pushy at that point. That's just the bold point, I suppose. Yep, That's, exactly. You're not you're not pushy yet because yeah. you don't know how they're going to respond. That's you're, correct. You're being uh, you're instigating the conversation or initiating the conversation. Um, but you know, like you say, um, another one is don't talk to strangers. Yeah, I mean, just we at least in in america like you shouldn't talk to strangers you no, shouldn't no, no, interrupt no, talk people's to day yep you shouldn't bother them but look there's people we meet all the time out and about and there's people on our streets at least in a suburban america where people go into their garage or they go into their apartments it's like we we are told like don't bother people when they're home from work yeah it's and right same here we have to be yep. okay with being politically incorrect by Go meeting our neighbors yeah. and go talk to them and invite them to dinner and invite yourself over for dinner. Like, get in their life. Yeah, get their, fantastic. Get their stuff. And there's people that are literally like, I just want to be left alone and it makes them uncomfortable. Sure. So, anyways, I think you're, I think you're getting the point and your people get the point. Probably the, the meta theme is um, we have to help people come to grips with like, I'm willing to do a couple things or one thing to be uh, politically incorrect. Sure. If I'm not willing to ever be that way, then I'm probably not going to be able to share my faith. Yeah, yeah. So it's helping people understand that that's a normal part of the Christian life. You are going to be uncomfortable. You are going to be awkward. You're going to have to push through because Jesus tells us to in the Great Commission. And so therefore, yeah. I think one yeah. of the points you made too about the Great Commission is it uh, it's you know Jesus' last words in the Great Commission are, I'm with you. <laughs> You know, yep. I'm going to stay with you to the end of the age, which is empowering because, yes, it's awkward, but in that awkwardness, Jesus is still there. He hasn't left us. Right. And, you know, I, I think I also comment in that part of the book about John 4 and Jesus' models with the Samaritan woman. I mean, he goes to a place he shouldn't be going. He's talking to a stranger. He's interrupting her day. Um, and he's pressing her on what's real about relationships. Sure. And, I mean, it's just very, like... You know, it's a, it's a weird practice. encounter, isn't it? It's weird. It's <laughs> uncomfortable. But look at this huge breakthrough. Yeah. And she's like wanting an encounter with God. And yeah. so that's what compels me. That's what gives me the passion to talk to you guys is to say there are people that are absolutely waiting for God and they want an encounter with God. But they're so bottled up. They're so confused. They're so full of shame that if we don't press through some politically incorrect things, they never will, and no. they'll never hear the gospel. But at the end of the day, they're going to be thankful. Yeah, for sure. They're going to be like that woman who's like, thank God this guy broke into Samaria, interrupted my day, you know, called out my sinful relationship patterns, and she's like, praise God. You yeah, know? that's right. And then she goes away and tells everybody. And totally. the stuff we're reading in Acts 4, right before Philip, the reason he's in Samaria, and Peter and John are there is because – it's because of this woman. She started the right. process. Uh, you know, totally. it was her going back and, and telling everyone about it. Right. We just never would, if I was to tell you at the beginning of the day, hey, I'm going to send you to a town you shouldn't go to and talk to someone you shouldn't talk to, and you're going to press them on their many marriages, you'd be like, heck no. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Like, but I promise you there will be a breakthrough, and she will thank you, and she will lead hundreds to the, to the Lord because of it. Yeah. Would you do it? And you'd be like, 
Well, I guess I would do I'd it if that's the three. case, but it's still weird. It's that's right. The weirdness doesn't go away. Hey, oh. pick up on that. Uh, a lot of our say small group leaders will be listening to this. So, so I guess how how can you help our small group leaders um, themselves and in how to how to encourage their small groups when they start to hear in the conversation they're having about some of these hesitancies are like you know oh, I'm a bit afraid to speak up I'm a bit afraid to push through the awkward um, what can our connect group leaders do in that context to create an environment where um, where it's they they can make our people feel safe to do that so you mean like how do you create a small group environment that's safe in the small group? Uh, both, I guess both, yeah, because we want to create small group environments that's safe for unchurched people to come to, that is, uh, you know, is embracing them, letting them, creating space for them to explore their spirituality and so on. So yeah, that's part of it. Um, and then also to just how can our small group leaders empower people in their small groups to to really uh, be encouraged to go out? What can what's some okay. practicals that they could do for that? Yeah. Um, the first part, like creating a, a group or an environment that's welcoming to like seeking people. Um, one, one thing that I would say is make sure either every sm- at every small group you have Bibles that are there for every person that are right. even the same kind of translation or even the same exact book. So you yep. can say like, flip to page 200. Sure. Brilliant. And everyone knows. Or what I actually do in my small groups is I print it all out on computer paper. Okay. I just hand them the passage, everyone, and I give pencils and you can draw on it and I let people know like this is really interactive. So it kind of takes the like religiosity away of like Bible stale stiff. Fantastic. I like to do that. Um, I think another thing is if you can – Stick in the Gospels um, when you're with seeking people. If you're going to create a group for seeking people, stay in the narratives. It's easier for people to see themselves in a story than it is in like a letter of Paul. Yeah, great. So if you can pick stories where Jesus is encountering another person, that's really good stuff to do in a seeking type group. If you want to do like Romans, like do that with your discipleship group. Sure, because that's that's obviously a lot heavier and it's important theologically, but it's not necessarily as conducive to reaching out, yeah. Right, I mean, in, unless you have a certain seeking person that you have trust with and you know they want to go there, if it's just like a generic group and you're hoping seeking people will come, stick to narratives in my opinion. Yep. Um, and then probably third thing I would just say is as a, as a leader, you always want to be setting ground rules from the beginning, like, Hey, any question goes. There's no dumb question. Um, things like just stick to what we know from the passage we're reading. Right. Like, let's not bring in all this other Bible knowledge and make people feel like, you know, they're dumb. Yeah, sure. Like, if we're studying John four. Like, let's talk about what we know of God in John four. Brilliant, Bo. That's uh, gold. And then another thing I would just say is. Um, be aware of like the Christian lingo yep. language and as the leader try and be interpreting those words frequently and keep reinterpreting for the group like oh you know if you're seeking this is what this could mean or bringing like normal language and then probably just lastly like another little tip that I like is um, if you know you have seekers coming like have note cards and then maybe at the end of the time like always give a chance, like hand out a note card and give a chance for people to write down any questions they have. Fantastic. And then you could like either pray for those questions for them or you could say, um, I'll look at the questions and I'll try and address one every week. Brilliant. Things like that. Great. So So you don't even have to have all the answers right there. You're just creating an environment where it's safe for people to ask questions and they can feel empowered to do so. There's no dumb questions. That's, That's great stuff, yeah. Yeah, and then and then on empowering people to go out, I mean, one thing I I would definitely say is, um, well, one, I'd want to set a culture of just, are you talking to people about your faith? And if I have Christians in my small group, I'm probably going to set some goals with them, like, hey, I want you to talk to someone every week, or I want you to talk to three people every week, right. and I'll just make sure they're having conversations. Um, one thing that I like to say, and I tend to help the people that I'm mentoring um, learn how to say something like this is I want every person that you know to know that you're a Christian and you want to talk to them about Jesus. 
Wow. And so what, what I will help them do is say something like this, and this is what I say as well. The people that I'm around, I'll say to them, you know, as I build trust, I'll say something to the effect of, you know, I have no idea if talking about faith is something that you're even interested in now. But if you ever do have a question or you're ever curious about Jesus, I want you to think about me. Yeah, fantastic. I'm available. Like, to ask me a question anytime because I love talking about it and I love helping people, you know, seek out their faith and seek out God. So don't ever feel shy about um, bringing that up to me. Oh, that's and brilliant. It's important to break the ice for all your friends and to help your people in your small group establish themselves as a spiritual leader and they need to be able to, to tell their friends that that's mm -hmm. not being pushy that's being authentic and then you can pull back and wait on god and pray but your friend will know yeah now oh if i ever have a question i can ask them yeah well i i talk about this quite a bit you know i think sometimes around the coffee tape the, the coffee counter at work on a monday morning people say what did you do on the weekend and unfortunately i think a lot of christians were, won't even say they were in church you know, I went to the football or I watched the cricket or whatever, but they're not right. even confident enough to say, hey, I went to church. Because even that in itself can be a enough of a, a peaking of interest in someone to go, you went to church, you know, and the door's open there for a conversation, but people shy away from that. Yeah, and like that kind of conversation is where I'll quickly stay a little bit on the offense. If, if I was to ask... What did you do this weekend? I said, I, you know, I went to church and I, if I could feel that it's a little weird or people are like, oh, that's where I would just say, look, I know you might not be that interested in that now, but if you ever do want to talk about faith, I want you to think about me and I, I would love to talk about it sometime. I'd love to take you to lunch. Brilliant. So you actually use that like, encounter. Yeah. Put it on them and make them go, oh, okay. And then I'm telling you, half those people will come back to you sometime and say, oh, well, I do have a question. Or, yeah. Or their marriage is on the rocks or their kids are wayward or some crisis in their world. And then you've got that handle you're talking about, haven't you? But, uh, totally. And you're not being that like weird Christian guy or gal. You're, you're being like strong about your faith. And like you're not embarrassed by it. And in fact, not only you're not embarrassed by it, you want to help other people. Yeah. And so no problem. I, I can always take the pressure off. Like no problem. You yeah. don't have to. But, you know, think of me if you want to. Oh, that's great, Bo. That is really brilliant stuff. You wanted to talk a little bit about um, how do you like not be pushy, be bold, yeah, but not pushy. Yeah, so we, we, actually, we watched, uh, so we've sort of passed around that video that you sent, the pushy and bold one, because you did that, such a great job with that. So yeah, maybe maybe share your thoughts on that a little bit. How do we find that difference, that subtle difference between yeah, being pushy so and bold? In that video, which sounds like most of you saw it, you know, I have a continuum where on one side is timidity and on the other side is pushy. And we want to find the kind of in the middle of that that uh, that line is. Oh, sorry. No, worry about it. I thought mine was going to ring too. <laughs> Weird how computers do that now. Uh, yeah, they ring. Uh -huh. Their phone rings through the computer. I know. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, we want to find that like that uh, balance between being patient and bold. Yeah. So I think what I would just say how I find that is. You know, whoever's listening to this, you know if you tend to be more on the timid side or the pushy side. Right. You just know that. Yep. If you don't know that, ask someone. Ask someone else. <laughs> and they'll tell you. Yeah. And so what I, what I would just say is if, if you are on the pushy side or people I know that are on the pushy side, I'm going to encourage them to actually become more present to their friends. And I'm going to encourage them to spend more time building trust, building relationship. And learning how to just be in people's lives, yeah. doing normal things without having to bring up God because they've already established that they're Christian and they're willing to talk about their faith probably. Yeah. Oh, and yeah. that will come up more organically. It, 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 if you're it more on the more timid side, then I would push you to actually talk to someone about Jesus in the next week. Yep, make you it a goal. You probably have people around you that are um, open and they're waiting for you to break the ice or to invite them or to have a conversation and you're nervous about it, but they're not. Yeah. And so, uh, finding that, that balance is, is right in there. Um, having to do with people's curiosity and openness. So the fine line is always, what is the person's curiosity level? Sure. If someone's curious and open, then you never can be really too pushy. You're only being pushy when someone is, 
showing you they're not curious or they don't want to go even further. And they don't and want to go further in the go. conversation. They want to get off the train, as you say. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So. And it might not be all the way to the station in the first go, but you might get halfway to the station. You know, you might get halfway to your destination in that Absolutely. first conversation. Yeah. Absolutely. One other question I was going to ask you, uh, I just thought of it today, actually, so I didn't put it in my notes, was um, you may or may not be able to answer this, but uh, how, how do you recommend, you, do you get asked very often about how Christians, uh, especially with everything that's happening with ISIS at the moment, how Christians should respond to Muslims? Because I, I don't know what it's like in California, but here it's about 50 kilometers up the road. We've got entire entire Lebanese cultures and Middle Eastern cultures, very a lot of Muslims everywhere. And uh, even a lot of the radicalized, uh, a lot of the ones who've gone from, from Australia to Afghanistan, young boys that have been radicalized and gone to, to ISIS, um, mm -hmm. live like 30, 40 kilometers from where we are. So wow. do you get asked that sort of question as to how, to how do you balance love versus judgment and that sort of thing with regard to Muslims? Yeah, and I mean, I've had some different uh, Muslim friends and students on campus that I've talked with. I wouldn't say I'm an expert in Islam or those kind of things, but uh, I think that um, what most people don't know is that Jesus is, is viewed very highly in the, in the Muslim faith. Yeah. In fact, he's the highest. Yeah. Uh, they just don't believe that he, you know, died on the cross. They believe he just went to heaven and, and he will actually come back, but as a Muslim. Yeah. So talking about Jesus uh, as a prophet is actually a really favorable place to start. Most Muslims love talking about Jesus. And um, I think one of the best things you can do with a Muslim is just get talking about Jesus, get talking about who he is, get talking about his commandments. They, they don't know him. Uh, in the same way that we would know him and with, you know, the New Testament, the Beatitudes and things like that. So if you can get having great conversation about who Jesus is and uh, as you build trust with a Muslim, even as you can talk about things like what is like one of the one of my favorite passages that I've talked about with a Muslim is when Jesus talks about um, being clean on the uh, inside versus the outside. Yep. It's huge in the Muslim culture to be clean and cleanse and to get into that conversation about, well, what, why do you think Jesus said that? And what is he getting at? And what does that mean? That That's always really helpful and intriguing places to go. Um, the hardest part with a Muslim that I would advise anyone to stay away from if they can help it is the Holy Spirit. Okay. I mean, the Holy, the Trinity for a Muslim is just, they cannot they wrap can't their mind Because there's so much on the, the, the one God, aren't they? Yeah, one, one God, God. And, yeah. unless you're really good at talking about it, you're just going to walk yourself into a corner. Yeah, well, the reason it came up is uh, I've read a couple of blogs, actually. So I read a blog uh, from J.D. Greer. Have you heard him from uh, Rayleigh Durham in South? Yeah, so I read a blog of his this week, and I posted it on my Facebook page and got a couple of comments on there. And I've got a lot of respect for him. He's ministered in Muslim, I think, in Indonesia. And his perspective is, is rather similar to what you've just said. That is, look for points of unity and mm -hmm. preach from the points of unity, start with those things and build upon them. He didn't mention what you said about Jesus per se, but I think that that's brilliant. But there's still people, I think, who, who come from the other perspective and think what, what he was saying was like, you know, uh, you know, if they believe in Allah, and the question is, and he says is, you know, is Allah the same God? And historically, yes, but obviously very different personalities to our God. But he was basically saying, find a point of unity and start there. I think that's what you just said. Yeah, I mean, they really do like to talk about him, and most of it, most people just don't know that he's a big figure in their faith. Yeah. They, we just know about Muhammad and yeah, um, you know, jihad, and jihad, and, and like so that. on. But yeah, Jesus is actually a big figure in their faith. He's just not God, no, so no. they don't talk about him that way. But he's actually he he is their um, so, top prophet. So I guess in some ways, what you're saying is you, you utilizing the principles that that Philip actually did with the Ethiopian in the chariot. He's reading about God, doesn't know who he's talking about, doesn't know, and he exercises, right. he starts with the point, starting with where Philip, where the Ethiopian's reading and, and brings Jesus into the conversation at that point. That's what you're saying to do, I guess, isn't it? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. I'm going to start making more, um, you could tell your leaders this, I'm going to start making um, some more just little two to five minute videos. Great. So if there's specific questions that, uh, you want answered? Yep. Um, and talking to the leaders here too. Just uh, drop me a line on my website, bocorsetto.com. Great. 
because I'm going to start in, in the near future here making like a weekly video. Yeah, okay. And if it's a two-minute thing, it's quick. People can listen to it on the way to work, yeah, listen to it on the flight. Simple. So if they want to drop a line like, what about this? Or how do you navigate this? I'll try and just start answering those oh, questions. That'll be gold. All right. God but, bless you. Really appreciate it. Yep. Bye. Okay. Cheers. Bye.